Thank you. It's an honor to be here, especially to follow uh, Rafi, my mentor and surrogate uncle. Um, on the slide, you'll see my email. I'd be happy to hear from you afterwards. Uh, part of this talk is contained in an article that was just published last week that I'd be happy to send to each of you. So here I am on the high wire without a net, trying to do an hour presentation in 15 minutes. So let's begin. Um, I will, there's some disparate threads here I'll try to tie together and hope that it becomes coherent at the end. Uh, the human gut harbors 100 trillion microorganisms, and there are 10 to the 12th per milliliter of these. Their genome exceeds that of the host humans 100-fold. There's a difference in obese humans. They have more of a type of bacteria called bacteroidetes, lower bacteroidetes and higher firmicutes. Um, this fellow, uh, Dr. Moeller, uh, did a very interesting study. They actually went and sampled in the field fecal samples from wild chimps, bonobos, which are pygmy chimps, our closest genetic relatives, gorillas, and human populations. The microbiomes of American humans are more different from those of Malawi humans than the gut microbiomes of Malawi humans are from bonobos. And you see the p-value there. You never see values like this unless it is a clear finding. Uh, looking at three different continents in humans, uh, th there were lower microbial diversity than in apes in with respect to the bacterial phyla, classes, orders, families, and genera. Uh, there's a constriction of the diversity. Um, Americans average 30 fewer bacterial genera, the lowest level of diversity. These changes have been associated historically, epidemiologically, with vast increases in gastrointestinal disorders, obesity, and especially autoimmune disorders. The same group uh, did a subsequent study, uh, again, uh, showing that uh, there are also anatomical differences. In apes, the colon is greater than 50% of the intestinal volume versus only 20% in humans. Uh, it's clear that several bacterial lineages have seemingly followed um, evolutionary-wise with hominids over the last 15 million years. Um, and again, in industrial nations, humans harbor the fewest genera of any primate. Uh, and there are two bacteroidus ACI lineages in apes that have never been found uh, in the American human subspecies, as I like to call it. And severity of irritable bowel symptoms is inversely related to the gut bacterial diversity, so this definitely has importance to disease. So what is a person to do? Well, uh, I'd suggest these things. First, probiotics that may be familiar to some of you. These are oral supplements of beneficial gut bacteria um, that uh, can be supplied as capsules or in fermented foods, especially kefir, lacto-fermented vegetables, uh, to replace the kind of thing that is missing. And then you need something that those bacteria like to eat. And those are probiotics. These are oral vegetative matter, indigestible sugars and fiber, fructooligosaccharides uh, that serve as a feedstock for the beneficial bacteria. Some other studies uh, looking at the relationship between the microbiome and psychology. Um, when people ingest bifidobacterium and lactobacillus probiotics, it reduces negative mood, a treatment for depression. Probiotics, these uh, special bacteria in elderly patients improved attention and working memory as compared to placebo, and that was statistically significant. There's some diseases, particularly clostridial infections, that are treated with fecal transplantation. When this was done in autistic children, uh, there were improvements in the behavioral and GI signs and symptoms over the course of the ensuing eight weeks. Presumably, this is something that needed to be repeated. 
again, the gut microbiota, these different bacteria affect neuropsychiatric status uh, in such conditions as autism, depression, uh, stroke, and schizophrenia. And the mechanism of action seems to be mediated through the autonomic nervous system, the enteric ner nervous system, the immune system, uh, and relates to bacterial metabolites. And I'm going to suggest now that there's a role for the endocannabinoid system here. Again, we've seen marked changes in the human diet as compared to past centuries. Uh, and at the same time, we've had skyrocketing rates of chronic disease, specifically obesity, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, other autoimmune diseases, allergies, diabetes, cancer, depression, and neurodegenerative disorders. And these were not rare in past centuries merely because we're living longer. Uh, it's demonstrable that there are more of these uh, per the population. Apparently, it's necessary to have multiple probiotic species, not single ones, to protect against pathogenic bacteria like Clostridia uh, and to gain these neuropsychiatric benefits. So, Additionally, probiotics may help control P. par gamma. This is a nuclear receptor you're going to be hearing a lot more about. Uh, it regulates gene transcription. Uh, recently, uh, it was shown that cannabidiol and also THCA, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, are agonists of this receptor. And it's been called the master regulator of adipogenesis, the production of fat, also regulating tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is important in autoimmune diseases and in inflammation. Prebiotics, so those vegetative matter that the bacteria like, change the microbiota to reduce fat production and stabilize the gut so that it doesn't leak and allow toxic metabolites to enter the bloodstream. We also know that CB2, the non-psychoactive cannabinoid receptor levels, correlate to concentrations of lactobacillus, what's in yogurt and negatively with clostridial species that are often pathogenic. A study that directly relates to the endocannabinoid system is this one from 2007. Uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus, common component of yogurt, a sp specific uh, strain of that was administered um, and induced CNR2, that's the gene that produces uh, the CB2 receptor, its RNA expression above that in the human HT29 epithelial cells, and that was statistically significant. Uh, so they demonstrated that as well as an enhancement of morphine's pain-killing effects uh, in rats, highly statistically significant. And that reduction uh, in pain was inhibited when a CB2 antagonist was administered. Uh, so that fits together. A very interesting study from 2011 looked at uh, obesity in cannabis users and non-cannabis users. What they found was obesity rates were only 14.3% and 172 percent respectively among participants using cannabis at least three days a week. Um, so that's a one-third reduction over non-users. Uh, additionally, those who use cannabis had uh, significantly better body mass indices. Do you know what yours is? Uh, another study directly relating uh, cannabinoids uh, to this issue was uh, done in Calgary. Uh, published in 2015 by Nina Clooney and the group there. Uh, DIO mice have a genetic susceptibility to obesity. They gain weight on the same dietary intake uh, that doesn't affect uh, others. When administered THC that altered their microbiome balance, um, affecting the firmicutes and bacteroidetes ratio. The THC essentially prevented the ratio increase or weight gain despite being on a high-fat diet. So this could help explain what we observe in humans, as we'll see from these demonstrations. People who use cannabis suffer from a variety of stereotypes. 
the most common one is uh, the cannabis user as a lazy slacker stoner, as we see in the illustration. But another one is this, that of the skinny hippie. And you see that uh, he's got a grocery bag full of vegetables, hopefully the right ones. But the truth is that the skinny hippie is the more accurate representation of what a cannabis user is likely to look like as opposed to the slacker stoner. Again, how do we change the way things are and this destiny that our diet has seemed to impose upon us? Well, in this prebiotic array, you see some vegetative matter that may be quite unfamiliar to you, starting with uh, acacia fiber in the upper left, chicory root, sometimes used as a coffee substitute, uh, sunchokes, otherwise known as Jerusalem artichokes, then dandelion greens, uh, burdock, and then the more familiar uh, Eleaceae, your onions, leeks, um, and garlic. All of these feed the beneficial bacteria in the gut. Additionally, uh, another thing that's changed about our diets is um, our vegetables have become tasteless. Uh, in ancient times, uh, people ate what they could gather and it included a lot of bitter herbs. Um, and these have largely fallen out of the diet, particularly Americans like things that are sweet and not bitter. This can be supplemented with herbal bitters, as demonstrated in the photo, um, and it's been shown that these are present not only in the tongue, but throughout the gut, and specifically in the brain, where they do such things as reduce hunger drive, the drive towards sugars, and also seem to correlate with um, reducing such disorders uh, as diabetes and even acne in the face. So the question is, can bitter herbs allay hunger via the hypothalamic and ECS mediated mechanisms and lead to weight loss and counteract the metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes? I believe the answer is yes. Here are a couple of books on how to eat. Uh, Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, which first came out in the 90s, but still uh, presents a very relevant diet on the more recent bestseller by Perlmutter uh, called Brain Maker, uh, correlating use of this kind of diet with prebiotics and probiotics to improvements in autism and a variety of other neurologic conditions. My hypothesis would be that we're seeing common mechanisms between the prebiotic and probiotic diet and what cannabis can do. And this has led to this diagram that was published last week, uh, what I like to call the gut or grand unified theory uh, that relates the microbiome uh, to treatment of various diseases, uh, including especially beta amyloid formation, uh, neurofibrillary tangles that are associated uh, with Alzheimer's disease and a, a variety of other neurodegenerative conditions. And as you see from the diagram, it's not only uh, beneficial bacteria, but uh, there's abundant evidence uh, presented in the paper, but not here today, uh, that supplemental THC, CBD, and even THCA um, may do similar things in allaying these type of afflictions. So this suggests a new approach to neurological therapeutics. I have always said throughout my career that it needs to be a preventative and therapeutic specialty rather than just a diagnostic one uh, to provide better treatment for epilepsy, tumors, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury, and sorry, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Part of this includes aerobic activity, which is known to stimulate the endocannabinoid system. Um, education throughout life seems to help uh, prevent dementia. And uh, above all, an anti-inflammatory prebiotic and probiotic diet uh, that should emphasize saturated and monounsaturated, that's olive oil, as we heard previously. Also, omega-3 essential fatty acids bioflavonoids uh, from things like berries, fermented foods, protein, and minimizing carbohydrates, which 
have only been used in abundance by humans for about 3,000 years. Additionally, this can be supplemented with cannabis extracts, providing the THC, CBD, THCA, caryophylline, and other select terpenoids. Three minutes remaining. Well, we made it. So, I guess people can come to the microphones and I'll attempt to answer questions. I did not plan that for, to come out within seconds. Any questions? So if you took, is this on? The microphone's on, just please talk closer. Okay. So if, if you took my bacteria, my gut, and I would imagine my um, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes level is a good one in, th in that I would have lower um, Bacteroidetes and higher Firmicutes. If you took that and transplanted it and did a fecal transplant into someone obese, what would happen? Um, they would expect an improvement in uh, their weight and, and intake. Uh, but again, it might be a temporary phenomenon. Now, it works the other way. Um, there is a rodent model of Parkinson's disease, and when um, you take the fecal matter from the affected mice and put it in those that, that aren't affected, they become symptomatic. Um, so this is being used a lot now in gastroenterology practices to try and improve the situation. The most common situation is treating um, clostridial infections that are really recalcitrant, and a lot of that is a function of antibiotic use. Uh, and I would point out that part of the reason we're having so much trouble with these autoimmune diseases is not just changes in diets, but overuse of antibiotics that are suppressing uh, normal, One minute desirable remaining. bacteria. So okay. follow-up question. I was surprised you didn't talk about antibiotics more in this talk because... Well, we only had 15 <laughs> minutes. 